Now, how the cost of living crisis affects Londoners is an issue we've been following carefully here on this station. Today, I thought we'd look at how this impacts on young people's lives, especially at a time when Christmas is approaching. How do you navigate this conversation with your children? How do you talk to them about what is an affordable present for them this year? Are you having conversations with them about why other children may have more presents under the tree? This is something counsellor and mental health activist Lily Jo has been writing about. She's the author of Talking to Children About Mental Health and joins me now. Thank you ever so much for joining us, Lily Jo. Um, this is a really tricky conversation, isn't it? Because you don't want, you want responsibility, but at the same time, you don't want to take away the joy. Mm, absolutely. It is a difficult conversation, but we do know from a a piece that's been done by young young minds that the cost of living crisis is impacting the way that young people feel today so uh, 21% of 11 year olds said that money worries had caused them stress and anxiety mm. so we know that this isn't every single family we know that some families will get through this cost of living crisis easy but we know that for 21% of 11 year olds right now that they said that money worries is causing them stress and anxiety so it's really important that that we do sort of arm ourselves with tools and things that we can do, say, and share with our children and young people around this time. Because as we know, children are aware of what's going on in the world. They have access to social media much younger. Mm. They watch news round. You know, they are informed and they know more than I certainly did when I was 11. <laughs> so it's really important that we, I think, as adults and caregivers, are giving children the opportunity to talk about how they're feeling and for children, children's parents, caregivers, people that work with children to actually have those conversations around what children and young people already know and how that is directly going to impact their Christmas this year. And I, and I remember we uh, went through a phase in my own family where we lost our, our family home and I remember that, that feeling of not only anxiety but also in effect, shame, you know, about you couldn't afford this and you couldn't afford that. And that's something you also need to be aware of when it comes to a young person, surely. Absolutely. You know, children and young people take on their own interpretations of what's going on. And, you know, they want to know that their adults are OK as well. Mm. Like they care about us and they want us to be OK. So I think it's important, first of all, that as parents, caregivers, that we keep those lines of communication with our children open, that we get curious about what they already know and how we can support them the best way possible. And I think, like I said, that's very individual to each family, isn't it? Yeah. What, give us an, an idea of some of the tools that we potentially could use with our young people when it comes to having these kind of conversations. Yeah, so I think one thing that we can do is have a conversation where we as adults are very present and able to have a discussion around how Christmas will be perhaps different or even perhaps the same as usual. Yeah. But having that conversation, you know, what do you know about what's going on in the news in terms of the cost of living crisis and what would you like to know about how we're going to do things? I mean, I guess <laughs> lockdown taught us that there are lots of things that we can do that don't have to cost the earth, that, yes. that, that can be cheap and cheerful and still bring the same amount of joy and energy. So it's about having that conversation and going, okay, what can we do? Let's write a list of things that are within our power that are, um, suitable for us as a family to achieve this season and let's tick things off together you know let's make sure that we're having the best Christmas but it doesn't have to cost you know hundreds of thousands of pounds mm. and I think that's one of the things where the 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 I, I'm going to call it the comparitis you know where yeah. you compare yeah. one to the other it's so important that if a, a young person and you can tell us more about this this is your area of speciality is so grounded in the love that they feel within their mm -hmm. family that they don't end up looking at somebody else I mean it's all hard for all of us whether you're an adult or a child but don't end yeah. up going oh I don't have that but rather saying I am content with what I've got yeah, I think it's really important that we teach our children how to be grateful and practice gratitude, make it part of our daily routines. So, you know, um, going around the dinner table sounds old fashioned, but going around the dinner table and saying, what's one thing that you're grateful for that happened today? Or what's one thing that you can share with us as a family that has been really successful for you today? So really 
practicing that and making sure that we're having that optimistic, positive um, conversation uh, and and being able to perhaps as parents and caregivers compartmentalize our own worries and issues where possible mm. obviously it can be really difficult to do but maybe giving yourself as an adult time where you write down a list of the things that is worrying you right now yeah. And then perhaps go through that list and cross off those things that you can't control because at the end of the day, if you can't control it, what is the point worrying about it? Easier said than done, but so true. And then writing down as many solutions as possible to the things that are in your control. What can be done? What can the children be involved in, in terms of those solutions? How can they get on board to make those things a reality? So, yeah, it's about, I think, practicing gratitude and then compartmentalizing the things that you can do and only you can do and engaging the children into the conversations that are appropriate and age appropriate for them. And and what are the signs that adults should be looking out for in their children? Because often you don't even have that conversation and you may not you you need to look out for something that says maybe I do need to have that conversation what sort of signs should you be looking out for yeah so I think perhaps if they're more anxious than normal um maybe having sleep problems so perhaps waking in the night when they don't usually wake in the night or just that feeling of maybe there's a little more anger around than usual you know they're a little bit more stroppy or having angry outbursts, those kinds of things, I would say are warning signs. So it's just making sure that we spot those and go, hmm, you know, what could be bothering them? Let's sit down and have a very present conversation about those things so that we can get to the root of that. And that's something that I really try and do with my children where possible is have those conversations that are age appropriate, Mm. but that are... um, giving them the benefit of the doubt understanding that they have their own voice you know empowering them to speak out about their emotions and how they feel and then when they do speak out about their emotions and how they feel helping them to feel safe for doing that yeah making sure that you you really listen and you really hear them I mean I think that that that, I mean of all the things the gift is to be able to listen to make space isn't it to be able Mm. to say we're all in this together we can have a conversation and yeah and and, you know and and kind of rub out some of the fear that exists because silence is such a deadly thing if you can't you know that idea of communication it it sounds like that's what is resonating for me in everything that you're saying Lily Jeff. Yeah. And actually, before I came on air, I just saw a picture on social media and it was of it, it was a picture that a, ch- a child had drawn and mm. they had to draw what made them feel safe. Right. And it was a picture of them in the middle of mum and dad in bed. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, how simple is that? It's just two people that love them. And I know that's not the case for every family sure. situation. This is what that child had depicted. It was mum and dad and them in the middle in bed. And I guess, you know, that doesn't cost any money at all, does it? That's just free. That's just love. And I think if we can be, yeah, present and loving and kind and put our own issues to the side yeah. and give ourselves that time, like I said, compartmentalize those worries for ourselves um, and just be as present as we can for our children, then gosh, we are so winning, aren't we, as yeah. parents? Yeah. And I think, I mean, I wonder, just before I let you go, what your thoughts are about how we have emerged from the pandemic and lockdowns into this space? Because I understand that there are increasing numbers of children who feel anxious anyway, having Mm. come out of that period of time because into this sort of blinking into this new world of freedom and and, and, Mm. and what you're hearing and and, and any top tips. I mean, obviously, they've been back to school now. They've literally done almost a school year, but there are still late. There's still some things that are lurking, aren't there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was a really tricky time, wasn't it? And I guess some people I speak to really appreciated the time. Mm. And actually, as I said, I have two children and one of them found it harder than the other. And I guess that's personality wise. One of them is super social and loves to be out with friends. So being 
that being taken away was really difficult. Whereas the other really thrived having one-to-one schooling at home, you know, much to our dismay, but (laughs) they really, they really thrived in that environment. So I really think that we just have to be so um, individualistic and making sure that we're giving each child exactly what they need. (laughs) And, And that can be difficult, but I think with the right amount of, care and attention and just focus we can do that and if they need extra support and extra help then obviously it's about getting that support and fighting for that support where you can whether that's going to your GP practice going into school really making a case for your child and really fighting their corner I think is hugely important when it comes to their mental health so things like anxiety things like depression yes they have all risen and now we know that there are more children talking about mental health, let's say, than there ever has been. So it's looked like the stats have got worse in terms of, I think when I first started out, it was one in 10 children were struggling with their mental health and now it's one in six. So those stats have got worse, but you could say that's because children are now able to have that uh, vocabulary and talk about how they're feeling and understand when things are wrong. So I see that as a positive in that children can now access the help that they need as and when they feel they need it. So I think as parents, we need to be aware of that, aware of that conversation, not be scared of it, but making sure that we are fighting the corner for our for our children. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much for joining us. A really illuminating conversation. Uh, let me just give you some details for Lily Jo. She's the author of Talking to Children About Mental Health. Keep your calls coming in on this 0800 731 2000. 